His Holiness Shri Guru Dev Ji, Ma'am uh, Vikrama Singha Ji, uh, Chandrika Ji, our very, very dear Bhanudi and Ashadi, <laughs> Elizabeth, uh, friends, and my colleague and friend, uh, Miss uh, Rita Bahuguna Joshi. Uh, we are mostly on the opposite sides. I'll try and not make a debate today because most of the things I agree with her and there are some things I don't agree with her. <laughs> On the rights issues, when it comes to women, I think there is a synergy, there is a cohesion, there is, uh, there is a common factor and the common factor is that we all want improvement. And the lady from Azerbaijan very rightly pointed out that things which connect us what is it that connects us? I think things which connect us is the family and the family value system. World across, wherever the women are, what matters the most is the children. What matters the most is the family setup and what has harmed the most is destruction of family structure. And it is here, I don't agree with my friend Rita Ji when she said that the women were not given the rights to perform the religious rituals in our country. I disagree with her, but she very correctly pointed out 50 years ago. So which was the right history? Because the correct history is that women even wore the sacred thread. And we've had women leaders, and leaders when I say, I don't mean political leaders, I mean leaders of excellence. The Vedic period, and who can tell us better when Bhanudi is amongst us, that I'm going to cite a few names because I don't want to make a mistake with the pronunciation. I want to cite a name, Viswara. She was a Rishi. Rishi is sage, what most of you who are not from India would relate Guruji with. Sages who were indulging in social service, keeping the society together and were doing good job with the people around and connecting them with the spirituality without dislodging their family structure. So people like Guruji and that essence in society could be a woman and her name was Veswara. Then we've had Apala. We've had Apala because certain Vedic hymns are assigned to this lady. So she was a scholar, like we can say Bhanudi, who was a scholar in Sanskrit who could read, write and compose hymns. So there was Apala. Then we've had Brahmvadinis, which I think a whole lot of us amongst us will be. Many women who did not get married, who chose a different path. Brahmvadinis served the purpose of greater life achievement in terms of knowledge, in terms of spirituality, in terms of reading and writing. So a whole lot of women amongst us will be Brahmvadinis, who are dedicating themselves to the larger cause of earth. I can just go on because I have this list of women from ancient India. And I and this is not exhaustive. This is what I tried to make a small list. But I can just go on. And since I'm going to restrict myself to 10 minutes, I'm restricting my order also and limiting the names of women. But from Kathi, Kalpi, Bhairavi, I mean, just go on. And this morning, when Yagya was being performed, that was Shakti, Shakti Yagya. To invoke the Shakti. So here is a culture, here is a religion, who doesn't look at women as devilish, who doesn't treat women different, who doesn't think women were born from a man's shadow, who doesn't think women are supposed to be mirror image of a devil, last one to be born amongst animals, and first one to sin? These are the thoughts this culture and religion is not full of. What this religion and culture is full of, at a point Rita Ji said, is you treat women as equal. 
and as Guruji has a man of his stature is performing Shakti Yagya. He is also invoking the Shakti that is the fem feminine power. And when we discuss power in our, and, and I know she's a teacher and she's a learned Sanskrit scholar herself, I'm nobody to quote, but just to take a few words away which she could have spoken, um, is that all the, all the words in vocabulary which invoke power are feminine in Sanskrit. All power relating to strength are women, I mean they are feminine gender, they are all feminine. And, and it is here, it is here that because Shakti is a feminine gender, Shakti is uh, power and strength, so that is a feminine gender, that is how my culture is supposed to treat women and I'm using the word supposed to treat women. And when I use the word supposed to treat, of course we have the seeds where we do get that kind of treatment. But there is a whole lot of influence which is coming from outside this country. It is time that the propagation of what Sri Shakti is starts from here and blooms all over. I mean, it has to be like the lotus. It has to open and cover everything around. It has to, it has to open and go out. It is happening the other way. And why it is happening? Because from the West, the economic and the political stewardship which is going across also is going the idea of a woman. The idea that woman needs to fight to become equal, not be respected for what she is, not be revered what she is. My culture gives me the strength to stand up, not as equal, but in my own right, separate and maybe revered and respected for who I am. So here is the question of how do you treat differences and how do you treat people. Now the moment you make it a western based context in terms of philosophical thinking, it becomes a conflict because there is a lot of subjugation and subjugation in terms of oppression, subjugation because you're not treating someone, not giving equal rights. Here women are not given equal rights but women are given more rights. The old lady in the house controls everything because she's the grandmother. The woman, the mother controls everything because she's the one who holds the keys. Now when distortions come in to this setup, there is conflict. And because of the distortions, the conflict is coming. It is not, the distortion is coming because we have also adopted the breakdown of families. Then I'll come down to two figures. I'll come down to the figure. First, I was talking about the empowerment issue. The empowerment issue exists because you, you treat people differently. And because you treat people differently, your approach is rights-based approach. This is my right. And the moment it becomes my right, it is conflict. And nobody is talking about duties. Nobody is discussing its rights versus rights. So rights versus rights or rights versus duties, it becomes versus which is a conflict situation. In a harmonious society, you try to resolve the conflict. And how you resolve the conflict, I think we have a concept called dharma. And dharma is what you follow, what you preach. And that is a, a social more which is internalized. It is not that somebody has to tell you what to do, it is what you feel. Nobody has to tell that you must look after your parents. You don't have to, nobody has to make that as part of law, though it has become part of our law also, because we have seen the cases of abuse. But internalizing the value system, the core value system, you are supposed to look after your parents anyways. Who else will? The state? Answer is no. It is my business to look after my family. It is my business to look after my children. It is my business to look after my old age parents. And that is why in the Eastern world, people do look after their old and invalid parents. It is here that people do look after their children. 
it is here that you have less and less dysfunctional families though the number is growing up it is it is going high but the harmony as we discussed in this morning harmony is resolving resolving the conflict harmony is adjusting with each other harmony is not nationalizing family because uh, i'll say in 40s in us the family um, had a membership of 3.6 member per family which is today reduced to 2.5 a 1% deficit now with 1% deficit obviously you need more homes um, half the marriages break two third of the marriages second marriages also break and third marriages also have their issues it is this value system which one is talking about it is this conflict resolution we are talking about coming back to my scriptures we have resolved conflicts like we all respect sita you know why we respect sita because she was a loyal wife she obeyed her husband till the t but we also respect meera who broke every law and did not obey the dictate of her husband that is the resolution of the conflict what is right we we respect ram for obeying his father till the t but we also respect prahlad for disobeying his father so this is the concept of dharma what is right what is your rightful duty what is the greater achievement you are talking about we keep questioning and what is supposed to be the rule the rule of law is to follow the dharma and what is dharma it is a spiritual conduct it is an internalized philosophy you follow dharma not because there is an imposition on you or you will be burnt on fire but because you are supposed to follow it there is no other way there can be no liberation the liberation has to come by following the dharma and we keep questioning even an embodiment of virtue ram we keep questioning was he right in sending his wife off to the forest we still have questions and we keep debating as a part of an articulate society which keeps debating what is dharma the dharma is follow the rule and nobody is above the law and and in that uh, there used to be a ritual where the king will get up and and why i'm making this distinction because greco roman philosophy goes in a different direction and it is greco roman philosophy which is followed subsequently in different religious forms and formats where the head of the church or a church meaning any any body uh, head becomes a religious head or the king cannot be questioned their authority is supreme so their authority is unquestioned unquestionable whereas in india the ideal i'm not saying that is what has been followed so but the ideal situation used to be that the king will take an oath to the office and when he takes the oath the word he will use is adand doshi adand doshi adand doshi adand doshi thrice he will say and the rajguru will come and hit him on his head with a small baton thrice and say no dharma dand doshi dharma dand doshi a dand dand doshi is i am supreme no one can punish me i am supreme no one can punish me and the rajguru guru like our guru ji here will get up give a stick to the king and say dharma dand doshi dharma dand doshi the dharm will punish you dharm will punish you so that is internalizing the value system that is what the value system has to be some nobody is supreme 
nobody is supreme what is supreme is the moral conduct what is supreme is the ethos what is supreme is the value system and it is this core value system which a person like me would want to attach himself or herself with and say this is what the religious and socio political context i come from and i would want to establish this as the prime philosophy of any political establishment any political establishment because it is not animal rights human rights women rights it is not the right based approach the approach has to be a cohesive society a cohesive society which knows how to deal with each one and give space to everyone without creating conflict it is this conflict it is this opposition which needs to be resolved and i'm going to touch a very sensitive subject though it is not the day to do it but the approaches the approaches even in case of homosexuality or differently gendered people i would say in differently gendered people or homosexuality indian society has accepted it absolutely in a very cohesive manner but it, it is never a question you ask a people exist it's their business it's their private life it is not to be questioned and eunuchs and others have been part of our system official system they have not just been part of the kings and kit and kingship or employed in the services but they have existed and people have not questioned their sexuality if you go to vedas and purans they 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 had so many positions of power and strength unquestioned unquestionable even in modern india this has not been an area of conflict this has because we have never debated this a uh, sexuality homo or hetero is somebody's private business not a public affair anyways now 377 which is a particular section in the ipc it is a criminal law according to the wording which of course was framed by the uh, colonial parts uh, and it was a law of the church it said to to same same sex people indulging in so language is bit sticky but the implementation of the law in india is nobody gets picked up for being a homo nobody you don't get to be caught by the police and thrown behind bars answer is absolutely not i mean i could stand here and shout anybody could stand here and shout you will not get picked up by the state for being for practicing a certain type of sexuality in your private life but what gets picked up what makes a crime if somebody is forced against the nature of that person that is how whatever be the language that is how the law is interpreted in my society and it is for this reason for 250 years we've only had 200 cases we've not had cases no i mean we've had parades and things nobody questions sexuality but from the west a distinction is sought to be imposed on india and india is being treated as a country as if we are persecuting people for their sexuality answer is no it is wrong it is incorrect nobody gets persecuted for being or following the sexuality a person is following what gets persecuted and prosecuted not persecuted but prosecuted is when another person against his desire has been forced into an act by another man that is what gets prosecuted so i think we have found our ways around things to resolve conflict we treat people with respect and with dignity and i think on a women's conference when we are dealing with the rights of women we are in the august company of some very eminent people and leaders and with the blessings of guruji i think the best way best way to deal with conflict is dharma rakshati dharma so dharma is the protector and it's our duty to protect the dharma is what should be the motto and that's the only way we can all resolve the conflict and make a harmonious society thank you friends